Father, please speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. It was Palm Sunday in Egypt. That was the day dual suicide bombings took place in a cathedral. Within seconds, 50 Egyptian Christians were killed, hundreds of them were injured, and the whole world suddenly had their eyes on that city, and the whole of Egypt, a country of 100 million people, were riven by this moment. A country where 10% of the population is still Christian, maybe more. The terrorists wanted to terrify the Christians. That was their ambition. They wanted to demonstrate to them who was in charge. They wanted them to quiet down their preaching, to stop their public displays, which is very difficult to do for the Coptic church because many Coptic Christians have a cross tattooed permanently on their wrist. But instead of the Christians cowering, running away, hiding, they did something extraordinary. The next day, on Monday, a call went out to fill the churches of Egypt with worshipers. And that's exactly what they did. They defied the terrorist. Every single church in Cairo was packed to the gills. All the rest of the country churches filled for a special day of worship. And in one Cairo church, the Coptic bishop who presided over that congregation, he delivered a message which was in English, from Arabic, entitled, A Message to Those Who Kill Us. Let me read you some of what he said. What will we say to those who kill us? The first thing we will say is, thank you very, very much. And you won't believe us when we say thank you. You know why we say thank you? Because you have given us the blessing to die the same death as Christ. And this is the biggest honor we could possibly have. He died, he was killed to forgive our sins. This is our faith. So thank you very much. Thank you also for helping us achieve our goal. You're helping us. You don't even know it. Because there are people whose homes we visited again and again and again, one time and two times and three times and four times, we begged them to come to church, but they still wouldn't come to church. What you're doing here, you're bringing to church the people who never came. Believe me, you are bringing to church those who never came to church. People who were living deeply in sin, but after this bombing, they woke up and said, my life is not guaranteed. Maybe I should take more care about my life. So you're helping us. All these visitations that we did, you are much, much more effective. You are filling up our churches. And I want to tell you one last thing, he said. And this thing you will not understand. We Christians, we don't have enemies. We don't have enemies. Others make enmity with us. Jesus said, I want to tell you that if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? But I say to you, love your enemies. The Christian doesn't make enemies because we are commanded by God to love his whole of creation. And so we love you because this is the teaching of our God that I am to love you no matter what you do to me. So I want to say to you, to those who kill us, I love you very much. And I want to say one last thing to you. We are praying for you. Because the one who told us to love our enemies also told us to bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. So the command that I have been given from my God, who is full of love, makes it my duty to pray for you. And he went on and on and on. See, the terrorist wanted to cause just that, terror, fear, intimidation, yet they only ignited the faith of those that they aimed to kill. That is the power.
power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not from this world. It's from another world. You as a follower of Jesus, you're a pilgrim, a sojourner. This is not your home here. You are visiting here with a message from God. In fact, amidst all of that chaos, something else happened. A famous Egyptian television news personality interviewed the young wife of one of those who was killed. Now, a widow with children whose father had been killed by a terrorist. And she told that broadcaster in Arabic on national Egyptian television that she had chosen to forgive the terrorist because of Jesus. And what happened was unbelievable. That famed Egyptian broadcaster on national television lost his composure. He was totally undone. And he said in Arabic, Egyptian Christians are made of steel. They aren't from this earth. He had the words of Scripture, you are in this world but not of this world, on his lips, and he didn't even know it. Not because he had read it, but because he had seen it through the testimony of those who actually believe what this book says and live it. And I, I can't help but think that there was some terrorist watching that broadcast that, on, on Egyptian television whose hate met its match at the foot of the cross because that is the power of the gospel. This is the beautiful, incredible, believable power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not just some cultural phenomena that we're a part of. You are not born Christian in, in, in the sense that you show up in a church and you live that way for the rest of your life. You have to believe something. You believe that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that no man comes to the Father but by him, that you are deep in your sin and yet he died on the cross and rose from the dead to forgive you. And when you get that, when you understand it, when it gets inside of your bones, you may live here, but you're not from here. The book of Revelation says they defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life so much that they were afraid to die. Wow. So this morning, to quote the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 1, I want to remind you of the gospel that has been preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. I want to remind you of the gospel. Because if we're going to give a portion of our lives to taking the gospel to the world, we need to make sure that our lives are being taken control by the gospel. See, there's a difference between learning and knowing something. Learning is sometimes just about repetition. You review it again and again and again. But knowledge is the product of something much, much deeper. Knowledge comes when information is coalesced inside of you. When you somehow begin to embody that information. When you not only know about something, but when it feels almost like it knows you. You are interacting with that information in a different way so that it begins to transform you. My wife and I, we have uh, three elementary-aged uh, children. Our, our daughter, by the way, is a, uh, she's nine years old and she loves ballet, and I cannot wait to show her uh, what, what happened here this morning. She's going to, you guys, uh, Zoe's, uh, Zoe's feet, feet uh, just got their biggest fan. <laughs> uh, we have an a, a 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 7-year-old, and, and our 7-year-old, uh, his name is Alexander. He's crazy. I love him very much, and he loves us, but he's crazy. When he was four... Because you have to understand, they are young. They're just learning the Bible. They don't totally know and understand it yet. They're just, they're just sort of getting it, though I just baptized uh, uh, two of them in the last uh, six weeks, which is wonderful. But when my seven-year-old was four, he was just sort of piecing things together from Sunday school. And so one day he went to my drawer in, uh, in our closet, and he took out these socks, and they were like multicolored socks. And he looked at my wife, and he said, 
these socks are like Joseph's socks. And, and Andrea said to him, Alexander, can you tell me Joseph's story? And he's a very confident kid with like total confidence without missing a beat. He said, yes, Joseph had lots of colorful socks like these. And then his brothers threw him in jail, but he broke out of the jail. <laughs> then he defeated Goliath and they threw him in the lion's den. <laughs> He had some uh, approximation to the information. He had some proximity to the information, but he didn't, didn't quite get it. By the way, this is the, this is the perennial uh, challenge of being, being a parent. Uh, <laughs> one time uh, we were in, in our kitchen, and uh, the 11-year-old, 9-year-old, who were uh, younger then, uh, kids talk about the strangest things, as they say, and they're having a conversation about who they would like to meet who's dead. And so my oldest, uh, Edward, looks at Catherine and, and says, like, if you could meet any person who is in heaven now, who would you want to meet? And Catherine says, Martin Luther King Jr. And then she says, no, 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 no. I want to meet Rosa Parks. And I look over at my wife, and I'm like, we're doing a good job. You know, it's like, no, no, it's a, this, is, this is good. And I was so proud of this. I, I, a little bit later in the morning, uh, I was, it was during COVID, actually. I was working at home. A little later in the morning, I'm on a Zoom call with my entire staff, okay? Like, lots and lots of people on the Zoom call, and I'm bragging about my children. I'm just telling the story about my kids, and just as I'm telling the story about my kids, Alexander, the seven-year-old who was then younger, he walks inside the room, and I'm like, it's Exhibit A, you know, our wonderful children. And he looks at the Zoom cara, uh, camera, and he says, hey, dummy daddy. <laughs> I don't know why I told those stories. <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference between having information and having it inside of you. And in this text that we shared with you this morning, Jesus is showing us the difference between knowing the data points of the gospel, the equation, your sin plus his death, burial, and resurrection equals your salvation. Jesus is reminding us of something more than the equation the data, the culture, the phenomena. He's reminding us of the value and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in a brilliant way, he does it by telling a story it childs, uh, children can even understand. A small child can understand this illustration. He says the kingdom of heaven, it's like a treasure hidden in a field. A man finds it. He, he sells everything he has and he bought the field. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And then he says, it's like a merchant who's looking for pearls. He finds this beautiful pearl. He sells everything he has and he buys it. And in that simple set of sentences are so many interesting things. I mean, one thing is the message was for different groups of people. You know, the, the, the merchant who found the treasure in the field was probably a working class individual. Uh, the, the, the merchant uh, who, who, who got the pearls is probably a more well-to-do person, a jeweler. He, he's saying that this message is for everyone, above, below, in between. It's for everyone. He chose these stories with intentionality, by the way. He, he's speaking in a particular context. Certain things came to the minds of the people listening to him when he used certain words. When he said, a treasure hidden in a field... You know, 2,000 years ago, if you've ever been to that part of the world, uh, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary place, I, I go there quite often. But it's a crossroads of civilizations. There have been wars and wars and wars over time as nations came and go and people went across, you know, the, the trade routes and everything that was there. And this was not a time of banks, okay? So it was sort of very common that you would, if you had really, really valuable things, you would bury your valuables underneath the ground, in fact, one, one rabbi even advised uh, his, his congregation in the Talmud to, to do this, to bury your valuables in the ground. This guy is just wandering around. He sees something sticking out of the ground, and he finds buried treasure. And so he sells everything he has to buy the buried treasure. And then the other one is a merchant looking for pearls. The most valuable thing in the world a pearl was worshipped by the Egyptians. In the Roman emperor, uh, Empire, Roman emperors brandished their wealth by having, by having pearls. And Jesus is saying, 
there was one person that was searching for something, the merchant looking for the pearls. There was another person who stumbled upon something, just going on the course of their life, and they stumble upon this treasure. But they both had the same reaction. When they realized how valuable it was, they were willing to sell every single thing that they owned in order to buy this one thing. And that is the gospel. When the lights come on, when it clicks in your mind, you would be willing to sell every single thing you have to get this one thing. But the good news is that it's free. It doesn't matter how deep you are in your sin, how hopeless you feel, it's free. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich and you were poor, he became poor so that you might become rich. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. We are saved. Like a drowning person caught at the last minute by a lifeguard, like a falling person who falls into a net. Saved. Jesus is our rescuer. And surely you know you need rescued. On your best day, you need rescued. I mean, how is life working out on your own? You ever lost your glasses on your face? I once drove away with the the hose in my car from a gas station. (laughs) How good are you at being your own God? How long will you fight what you know is true? Whether it's your salvation or post-salvation, the surrender of your will to God's will for your life, isn't it about time to like raise your hands in the sky and surrender? God, you're right, you're true, you're good. I need you to forgive my sins, but not just to forgive my sins. I just need you to breathe the next breath. When you surrender to this good news, it is just natural and logical. You want to tell other people people about it. And this is the good news that we take to the world. The Great Commission is our life's mission, whatever our vocations. God's will is more about who you are than where you are or what you're doing. And some of you should this week, maybe right now in your heart of hearts, decide to give your life or a portion of your life to serve as a full-time missionary reaching the unreached, to complete the Great Commission in your generation, which can be done in your generation, to take this good news to a world which desperately needs it, and that may require sacrifice and danger and risk for some of you. But for all of you here today, for all of us, we need to decide to integrate God's mission in our life's mission, our vocation, whatever it is. God calls people to do all kinds of things. But whatever you do, wherever you are, the love of Christ compels us to do it differently, to share his good news, to be a different pi- type of person while we're doing it. And this This is how the world is saved, and not a single one of us is excluded from it. What is God trying to say, not to us, but to you? God, reach into the deepest recesses of our heart and show us the way. In Jesus' name, amen.